you have a Bible, please turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Excuse me, um, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. It's a great joy to be with you again tonight. And um, just praise God for the sweet time of worship he gave us this morning. And, um, and we'll continue through tonight. Um, tonight, I want to begin by asking a question. Um, well, before I do that, let me, let me introduce a little bit what I, what I want to do here. The next few weeks on Sunday evenings, I want to uh, go through the doctrine of Scripture, the doctrine of Scripture. Um, and the reason I've chosen to do that is because... The Bible is where everything else derives. All our understanding, all the truth that we hold fast to and believe in comes from the Bible. And so to have a, we must have a correct understanding of the scriptures uh, so that we can have a good grasp of everything else and this, the, uh, from which everything else flows. And so I thought it would be helpful to go through the doctrine of scripture and to lay um uh, a good foundation for us going on into the future. And tonight, uh, as I begin, the question I want to ask is this. What is your ultimate authority? That is, when you're pushed to the very bottom of your thinking, what is it that, that tells you what's right and wrong? What is it that tells you What's true and false? What's at the very bottom that informs the, the whole rest of your life? How you, how you think, how you comprehend, how you understand the world to be. <clears throat> you see, at the root of everybody's thinking, we have root assumptions. Things that we presume to be true. Oftentimes things that go unquestioned. Uh, today, a very popular thing is, um, is simply feeling. You know, you can... You can go back several decades now in Disney films where they have songs like, you know, they say stuff like, just follow your heart. It sounds very innocuous, doesn't it? But think about over time, as you're told that over and over, you, you begin to believe, even though you don't say it consciously, that whatever feeling pops into your heart, my goodness, that must be true and I should just follow it or obey it. And if I don't, then I'm denying myself. You see, it seems very innocuous, but really it's teaching us something fundamental about how we think about the world. And for different, so for different people, it's different things. And tonight what I want to do is I want to make the case that the Bible is the word of God. And as such, it is the final ultimate authority for everyone ultimately and the final standard of truth that there is. And I'm going to do this um, a couple different ways. The first thing I think that should be said is this. Because the first part of the sermon, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the case from the Bible that the Bible is the ultimate authority. And if you think about that, you know, you're going to think, you know, if you're philosophically inclined a little bit, you're going to think that's problematic because you're arguing in a circle. I believe in the Bible because it's the ultimate authority. I believe it's the ultimate authority because it's the Bible. The fact is, that's true. <laughs> that's exactly what I'm doing. Because when you get down to matters of ultimate authority, inevitably you have to argue in that way. And what I mean is, if I say, if I appeal to something else to ground the Bible's truth in, then that other thing is the ultimate authority. In other words, let's say if I say that my feelings are my ultimate authority. Well, how do you know your feelings are your ultimate authority? Well, because I, I feel like it's right. Or is it, what, what if my human reason is my ultimate authority? That means that I believe that whatever seems reasonable to me, that's what's going to be what's right. That's going to be what's true and false. Well, how, why, why, do, why do you make your reason your ultimate authority? Well, because it seems reasonable to do so. In other words, when we get to down to matters of ultimate authority, you have, to, you have to appeal to the ultimate authority. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to do in a couple ways. I'm going to 
Um, I'm going to explain from the Bible what the Bible teaches about itself. Then I'm going to go and give some evidence outside the Bible of why we should believe it's true. And then at the end, I'm going to explain ultimately why we believe the Bible is true. Okay, so what the Bible says about the Bible, uh, other evidence for the Bible, and ultimately why we believe the Bible is true. Okay, so um, first of all, the Old Testament. The Old Testament. When we look at the Old Testament, what do we see? In the Old Testament, what do you have? You have hundreds of times men record these words, thus says the Lord. So what are they saying? Think about it. You have men who are writing down words in a book, and they are saying that the words that they are writing down are coming directly from God. Think about it. The words in this book, and it's particularly the ones of the Old Testament that are prefaced by, thus says the Lord, the men understood what they were writing was coming directly from God. In the Old Testament, God is often said to speak through the prophets. Large sections of the Old Testament claim to be directly from God himself. And then when we move to the New Testament, it becomes even more clear. And that's, uh, that's, the, that's the, the text that I asked you to turn to. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Paul says this. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So we get to the New Testament, and Paul says that all Scripture is breathed out by God. When he says the word Scripture there, it's the Greek word graphe, and every one of the 51 times it's used in the New Testament, it always refers to the Old Testament Scriptures. And what does he say about the, the Scriptures? He says that they were God breathed out by God. In the Greek, it's one word, theopneustos. Theos means God. Pneuma means wind or breath or spirit. He's, so Paul is saying that the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, were literally breathed out by God. That's what he's saying, literally from the mouth of God. In 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter says, No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So what is Peter saying? Peter is saying that no prophecy, and if you understand what the New Testament authors believe about the Old Testament, they believe pretty, they believe pretty much the whole Old Testament is prophecy. Okay, The first five books of the Bible were written by Moses, who was really the first prophet. All right, Samuel, a prophet, wrote many of the history books. And, of course, the, the Isaiah, Ezekiel, those were all prophets themselves. So they understood the whole Old Testament to be prophecy. And Peter said, no prophecy was wit written by the will of man. Peter said that the, 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 the words contained, uh, and, and he's talking about the Old Testament, the words contained in that, they were, not, they were not written down by the will of an individual man. That, that means, what that means is that, the men, as they were writing down the Old Testament, they were, they were writing it in their words, using their minds and their personalities. But what Peter is saying is that the Holy Spirit was superintending their writing in such a way that every word they wrote down was exactly what God wanted them to say and exactly what he wanted to record for the future. That's what he's saying. And that's what the Bible testifies about itself. In uh, Acts chapter 1... For example, uh, it says, Peter stands up and he says, Brothers, the scripture has to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David. And then he quotes a psalm. What, is, what has Peter done? He said that in the psalm that David wrote down, who was speaking? The Holy Spirit. You see it? You're beginning to see what the Bible is teaching about itself? That is that it, was, it, it, came, not, it came ultimately... From God through man. Think about what Jesus said uh, during his temptation by, by the devil. He quoted Deuteronomy and he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And how did Jesus defend himself against the temptation from the devil? By quoting scripture, right? 
So it's clear that he understood that the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, had come from the mouth of God. In another place, Jesus said the scripture cannot be broken. In other words, if you believe what Jesus believes about the Bible, you'll believe in an inerrant Bible, in an authoritative Bible. Now, of course, what about the New Testament? Because that's what the New Testament authors were saying about the Old Testament. Well, in 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter writes about Paul's writing. He says, uh, 2 Peter 3.15, he says, Count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. So what's Peter saying? Well, first of all, he says the Bible's hard, some of the Bible's hard to understand, so don't feel bad when it's hard to understand, because Peter said Paul was hard to understand. And number two, he's saying he, he's putting Paul's writing on par with the other scriptures. In other words, the New Testament authors had an awareness that what they were writing was the same level of authority as the Old Testament. And, of course, when you think about what the New Testament teaches about how uh, Jesus, for example, in John 14, he says, he tells his disciples, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So when you account for all these things, you see that both the Old and the New Testaments were understood by their authors that they were written down by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. That they were given by the Holy Spirit of God. That this book, in the understanding of the apostles and of Jesus Christ himself, comes from the mouth of God, from the Holy Spirit of God. Every word in it can be believed, trusted, and is true. Okay, so that's the evidence of the Bible for itself. Now let me give you, and I think, by the way, that that's the most important evidence that we can give. Nevertheless, if something's true, it's going to be true in every arena, okay? And so there are, there's evidence, of course, outside the Bible for believing the Bible is true. Let me give you some. First, let me give you some philosophical evidence. This is actually an argument for the existence of God, but it corroborates what the Bible teaches about God, and so it supports, I think, uh, the truth of the Bible. Um, this is just a good one to tuck away, by the way, too, if you're ever in a conversation with someone. But it's, it's, actually, it's called the Kalam Cosmological Argument. You don't even know that. All right, number one, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Number two, the universe began to exist. Number three, therefore the universe has a cause. Sounds very simple, right? Well, that's because it is. But think about this. The universe consists of what? Time, space, matter, right? Well, if a cause created the universe, then what would that cause have to be? It would have to be not contained in space, that, that is immaterial. It would have to be incredibly powerful to create the whole universe out of nothing, right? It would have to be timeless outside of time and space itself, so therefore it could create time, and it would have to be personal because it would have to choose to create as opposed to just letting nothing exist forever. In other words, the argument, the argument tells us that the cause of the universe has to be exactly what the Bible says God is like. <laughs> it's the biblical conception of God. Let me give you another uh, argument. Uh, it's the moral argument. It goes like this. Objective moral values cannot exist without God. We talked about that uh, a couple weeks ago. If there is no being outside of you and me to tell us what's right and wrong, then it's just your opinion. Then we, you know, if we're just highly evolved animals, there is no meaning, there is no morality. It's just, we're just, uh, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, survival of the fittest, you know, hope you survive. Okay? So, premise one. Objective moral values cannot exist without God. Number two, objective moral values exist. 
I believe that. Some people will deny that, but I believe that. I don't know anyone. Some people will say, well, they don't really exist. But the problem is, again, I, t- I told you before, the problem is if, if you steal their wallet, if you do something, if, 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 I mean, you know, you want to talk horrible, you know, if something, if something horrible happens to them or to one of their family members, someone's attacked or, you know, God forbid, raped or something like that, what will they say? They will not say, I think that was wrong. They will say, that's evil. It's wrong. It's really wrong. See, we all know that objective moral values exist. But if objective moral values cannot exist without God, but objective moral values exist, therefore God must exist. And of course, if you, to me, this is one of the, I think it's one of the greatest arguments because it's so funny. We live in a world... We live in a moral outrage culture. You say one wrong thing on social media, what happens? You're destroyed, right? You're you're totally killed. Everyone jumps on you. you, But it's so funny because the same culture that acts like moral values don't exist is the same culture that will jump on you if you break their secular moral values. You see it? But the beauty of the Christian ethic, and I think what testifies to the truth of the Bible, is that there is nothing like the Bible that corresponds to what we innately know about ethics. What am I talking about? We, all humans live in, a, in an ethical tension in which we, we desire to balance justice and mercy. In other words, we know that justice is right. And we know that mercy is right. But the problem is, is we have no way to reconcile the two. When someone sins against you, you want justice. When you sin against someone else, you want mercy. You see? But we have no way to reconcile the two. If, a, if, a, if, if, our, if our law code was nothing but mercy, then serial killers and rapists would go to court and the judge would say, well, I'm a merciful judge. You can go home. But if it was nothing but pure justice, there would never be any hope for anyone who ever broke the law. There'd be the death penalty 24-7. But how do we reconcile the two? The beauty of Christianity, and this is really unique because it's only, only the Christian worldview is the only worldview, even among all the religions, uh, that, is, that is based on, the, on God satisfying justice in a man named Jesus Christ so that he can really punish sin and really show people how sinful sin is by punishing it on an evil part, on a sinful, excuse me, on a sinless person, by punishing sin to show us how evil sin is and yet allowing him to still show mercy. Don't you see it? Don't you see what the uniqueness of Christianity? In Christ, on the cross... God has both, he did not sweep sin under the rug. Some people say, well, why can't God just forgive? You know, why did Jesus have to die? Because we all know you can't just sweep sin under the rug. Some people say, well, I don't know, you know, why doesn't everyone go to heaven? And I asked them, do you, re- you really want to room next to Hitler in heaven? No, we, we, all, we all know that there's, this, there's both mercy and justice and God unites them in the person of Jesus Christ. Some other reasons. Um, Okay, this one. Another reason the Bible is true. The Bible most adequately, in my view, explains what we observe concerning human life and nature. The Bible most adequately explains what we observe concerning human life and nature. So think about this. There was a... There was a... There was a time several decades ago now, early in the, in the 1900s and the Enlightenment time and so on, late 1800s, where the, kind of the prevailing worldview was that, that man is basically good. Sometimes you still hear that, you know. Well, yeah, people are basically good, so, um, you know, just... You know, just kind of live and let, you know, live and let live, you know, just let go and et cetera, et cetera. Um, But now we live in a world that we have so much access, you know, through Internet and stuff to things that go on in the world where 
Or sometimes people just go to the opposite, say, in, des- in despair and just say, man, look at all the wickedness in the world. This is one of the arguments that people level against God. They'll say, look at all the wickedness in the world. Look at all the evil in the world. But you see, the Bible, I think, like no other worldview and like no other religion, it accurately and gives us a, 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 the most accurate explanation of what we see in the world and what we see in the world. The Bible, how is it that, that people, that, this, that human beings can be both so sacrificial and selfless and loving and caring on the one hand, and yet on the other hand, do the most heinous, wicked, evil acts that you could possibly imagine? We've seen them both. How is that possible? The Bible actually gives us a perfect explanation. We were made in the divine image. And yet sin came in and ruined it. And so, therefore, we still have the image of God in us. Therefore, we still are innately valuable as persons. But nevertheless, that image is deeply marred and corrupted and defiled by our sin. Therefore, even in the most evil person, sometimes you will see flashes of the divine. And even in the most holy person that you'll ever meet, you still smell the odor of sin. Only the Bible gives you a nuanced view of humanity. It also explains other things that we understand about our human nature. Think about this. Why does nobody want to die? Why? If we're just, if we're, you know, it's, it's natural. It's the way things always were. It's the way things always will be. But why does every, why does every human being that you know, don't, they don't want to die, they want to live? Well, it's because we were made to live forever. <laughs> And you hadn't forgotten it. You hadn't forgotten it. And so there's philosophical reasons, there's existential reasons, and finally, there are historical reasons for believing the Bible is true. No ancient text has ever has been more archaeologically confirmed than the Bible concerning its historical claims. And specifically, Christianity hinges on a historical event. That is, the bodily, physical resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth 2,000 years ago in Palestine outside the gates of Jerusalem. And what we have in the New Testament, according to historic, uh, uh, historically speaking, what the New Testament is composed of is actually first-hand accounts of historical events, first- or second-hand accounts, of historical events written by, written by those who were present or associates of those who were present who claimed to see Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Now, lots of scholars used to challenge all this stuff, but basically pretty much now it's recognized that these things are, are, are unchallengeable. That most of the New Testament books were written before 70 AD, which would have been within... 40 years, 30 to 40 years of the, of the claimed events, right? Of the claimed events. Far too early for stories to become legendary because people would have still been alive who would have seen Jesus with their own two eyes. It's hard to make up a legend when people are alive who are there. And of course, that's the late date. Uh, uh, Paul was martyred. Uh, tradition says under Emperor Nero, whose reign ended in AD 60, he was probably martyred around AD 65 or 66. That means most of his books were probably in the early 60s or 50s. That is within 20 years of the events of which he testifies. Some of you people are older than 20 years old. Can you remember with uh, Can you remember pretty well some important events that happened 20 years ago? I think you can. <laughs> Well enough that if someone else had come and tried to fabricate a whole false story about it, you'd be able to say, what are you talking about? That's not, that's not even close to what happened. And of course, in some of Paul's writing, there are what scholars have identified as is not, he, he begins quoting something in his writing. It's, 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 pretty, it's well attested to, in some of Paul's writings, he has 
quotes that are clearly not his compositions, but what are obviously hymns that were repeated in the New Testament church. And if he's quoting it, if he's quoting a hymn that was repeated in the New Testament church, that means it was written far before that, probably within five to ten years of Jesus' life. And so we have eyewitness testimony within years, just a handful of years of the events that are taking place, claiming early, early that the New Testament Christians believed within five years of a man's death that that man was God. You just don't make up stuff like that. If I, if I died and then five years later people started saying he was God, everyone in this room would be like, have you met him? <laughs> did, you, did you know him? Now take the book of Luke, for example. The book of Luke was almost certainly written around A.D. 60 because it only records up to Paul's first Roman imprisonment, which was probably around A.D. 60 or or 62, something like that. And and it it ends kind of abruptly, if you've read the book of Acts, it ends kind of abruptly with with Paul still alive but in prison, right? So, So it almost certainly was written before Paul was killed, obviously, or else he would have put that in there, right? And... And we, we know that Paul had a second imprisonment. He wasn't killed in his first imprisonment. So it was probably, it was early A.D. 60, in the A.D. 60s. Now, scholars have shown that the book of Luke, think about this. The book of Luke contains at least 84 details that have been confirmed geographically, historically, and archaeologically validating its historical authenticity. Uh, validation such as Luke gives the correct locations of ancient cities, which they go, and, and Luke says the city was here, they go, they dig it up, and then, yes, it was there. Landmarks. He gives the correct towns for names during his day. He, he gives the correct titles for various officials within various places. Think about it. All these cities in the Roman Empire, they have different titles, even though it may be the same office. This city calls the office one thing. This city calls that particular office another thing. Luke uses the correct title for each different town. He gives accurate naming of Roman officials during the period. He uses, the, he, he uses accurate and precise ethnic terms for people living in different regions. He gives the correct references to Roman law practices. He gives correct references to ancient nautical practices, the way they practice seafaring, and many more. Now, the only thing that you could say concerning Luke and his precise use of historical details, you couldn't say that he made it up because all of that stuff's historically confirmed. The best thing that you could say concerning the, the, um, the book of Acts is that Luke wrote historical fiction. In other words, he used historical details but then made up the storyline. The problem is, is that historical fiction, <laughs> it didn't exist back then. It, we write historical fiction today, but it was not a genre that existed back then. There's no, there's no single example of historical fiction in ancient, liter- in ancient Greek literature. It doesn't exist. You would have to say that Luke created one time out of the blue a new genre of literature out of nowhere from his own mind. Or he just believed that he was writing down the truth. (laughs) And what's so interesting is that the same guy who is so precise about details and locations and distances that he talks about they traveled in the book of Acts. In that same book, he talks about people being raised from the dead. He talks about people being healed. He talks about God moving in power. He's telling the truth. What else? How else do we know that the Bible wasn't made up? The New Testament wasn't made up? Let me give you a few more reasons. Number one, the New Testament authors included embarrassing details about themselves. If you were going to start a new religion and you were going to make up its founding documents that people would read for future generations forever and ever... You would make yourself look good. But when you look at the New Testament, the leader of the church, Peter, he denies Jesus. He's rebuked by Paul as a hypocrite. They're cowards. 
the disciples doubted the resurrection. And they wrote it down for the rest of the world, for all of humanity, 2,000 years later, we're still talking about it. Why? Because they, want, because they were making it up? No, because it happened. What else? The writers include theologically challenging statements. Let me give you an example. For exa- Jesus, for example, is recorded as saying that he didn't know the time of his return. That's a challenging statement. In fact, some people read that and say, look, there's a contradiction. Uh, the, the Bible's not true. So, in other words, people say, some people use that as a, as a way to say that the Bible's not true. And we could talk about that verse some other time, by the way. But the point is this. It's actually the opposite. In other words, if you were making up a religion, would you include things that you're founder said that would be theologically problematic for you, or would you just make it smooth so that all things made, made perfect sense the first time you read it? But the fact that they left in theologically challenging statements concerning their own teaching shows that, that they wouldn't have included it if they were making it up, but Jesus said it, so they put it in there. Give you another example. Jesus cursing the fig tree. Jesus goes and he curses the fig tree. The Bible even says it wasn't the time for figs. And you read that and you're like, whoa, Jesus, calm down, bro. You know, you're just cursing fig trees left and right. Why would you include that in there? Unless it happened. What else? They include surprising details about Jesus' death and resurrection that would be almost unthinkable to name up. A couple of examples. Number one. They, they, they specifically name Joseph of Arimathea as the person in whom Jesus is to, uh, that, uh, person whose tomb Jesus was buried. Well, Joseph was a pro, it, it, the Bible says it, he was a prominent member of the Sanhedrin. That is the council of 70 that ruled the Jews. That is, if you're making something up, you don't name the most important person people know. <laughs> And say, ask him, he knows about it. You don't do that, but they did. What else? They record that women were the first eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. The problem is that women in that culture were not considered reliable witnesses, and their testimony was not even admissible in court. If you were in a patriarchal society, if you were making up a story about a historical event that happened, the last thing you would tell people is, oh, yeah, all these, all these hyped up women came and told me what happened. <laughs> that's, that's not what you would do. <laughs> but that's what they wrote down. Because that's what happened. What else? The New Testament writers, when you read it, they actually challenge the readers to examine the facts. In other words, when you read the New Testament, they're not, they're not guys. If you make up a religion, you write, your, you write your, your book, but then you tell people, look, just trust it. Just believe it. Just trust me. But that's actually not what the New Testament writers did. The New Testament said, the Apostle Paul said, uh, Jesus appeared to 500 people at one time, most of whom are still alive. Go ask them. Check my facts. And finally, and really I think most significantly, a great number of the New Testament writers and early leaders of the Christian church, think about it. Who Who were the early Christians? They were Jews. Who were the Jews? Well, if you were a Jew, what would you think about yourself? I'm the chosen people of God. We have the practices. We have the law. We have God. And the Gentiles don't. And your identity is in being a Jew because God chose the Jews specially. Why would a bunch of Jews who have God... Upon the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and and their claim that they saw him rise from the dead... Why would they abandon their their dearly held, sincerely, deeply held beliefs that they've held their entire lives and begin to practice new practices? And not only that, 
But most importantly, just about all the New Testament authors and early leaders of the church abandoned their former dearly heard beliefs for a new belief that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead, and then they died martyrs' deaths holding that belief and holding that claim. And again, if, if there were people making it up, it would have been these guys. It's, it's not like a Muslim martyr who just believes that he has the truth. These are the guys who, who, are, who are starting the religion, and they're dying for what they claim to have seen with their own two eyes. So philosophical, existential, historical reasons for all we should believe the Bible. Now finally, how do we ultimately know the Bible is true? Well, this is a complicated question now, isn't it? I think the Bible has overwhelming evidence for its truthfulness and for its authority. Nevertheless, not everyone will accept it. Uh, I talked about a couple weeks ago that there is a moral dimension of knowledge. Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14 says, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. In other words, how do we... I think like all the arguments that I just gave for the truth of the Bible, I think they're good. I think they're right. I think they're true. But if you just have an intellectual debate with someone, you'll never convince them. You just can't. They, won't, they, can't, see, they can't see that it's true until they want to see that it's true. Until the Spirit of God comes upon them. Therefore, I think the most important thing that anyone can do, and when I talk to anyone, the thing that I always tell them to do is this. Read the Bible. Just read it. Just read the Bible. Because when you read the Bible, what do you see? You see the testimony of men who were changed by the power of God. I love, I mean, my goodness, think about the Apostle Paul. When you read the Bible, if, you, if you've read the Bible and you read the Apostle Paul, I mean, Paul is undeniably an historical person who existed. He's writing these letters to these churches. You read the New Testament, you read the Apostle Paul, and you, th- you have to explain what happened to that man. How would a man who was a Pharisee, who was killing Christians, all of a sudden do a total about face, proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, risen from the dead, and go to a martyr's death for for what he's done, for what he did, for what he saw, for what he believed? You have to explain that. And when I read the New Testament and I read what he writes about how he proclaims the unity of the church and how Jesus Christ has forgiven our sins and is reconciling the world to himself, I read it and I see what that man has done with his life and I look at him just like I would look at an eyewitness on the stand in the court of law and I would say, I know that man's not lying. He can't be. So that's what I ask anyone and everyone to do. You read the Bible for yourself. Honestly weigh what it says and just ask yourself, are these people lying? Or should I believe what they have seen and heard? And when you read the Word of God, remember, it's breathed out by the Spirit. When you read it, I believe the Spirit of God will come upon you and give you sight. And so today, if the Spirit has shown you what is verified by philosophy and history, then you know as well as I that we have and that we hold the very words of God preserved for you over thousands of years that you may know how to have life, eternal life. The John in Revelation heard a voice and that voice said, these words are faithful and true. And if we devote ourselves to this book, day in and day out, and behold God through this book and agonize over this book and obey this book and believe it, even when it's hard, because believe me, some of it's hard. Then I believe we'll see God do a mighty move in our midst. 
Won't you bank your life on the unshakable promises of God? Once you, once you, once you get it, once you believe this book is true, it changes everything. My goodness, folks, he's coming back. And maybe today, excuse me, maybe today, I don't know, maybe today for the first time you've seen, like you've never seen before, that it's true. And you could come to this risen Lord Jesus tonight. We're going to sing a song of invitation. Um,